Welcome to a special program of the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California, featuring the national online premiere of Surviving the Silence. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial. We hope you're staying safe and are well wherever you are. And we look forward to seeing you in person one day again at the Commonwealth Club's headquarters in San Francisco. Until that happens, we are doing all of our programming online. This is the latest in nearly 350 online programs the club has produced in the past eight months. You can find all of our upcoming programs at commonwealthclub.org. Now, get ready to sit back and watch Surviving the Silence. I want to thank producers Cindy L. Abel and Mark Smolowitz for making this possible. I also want to thank Weatherford BMW for providing additional support to the Commonwealth Club for this Michelle Miao Show program. If you are watching us live on YouTube, you can use the chat feature to post questions for our guests. And stick around after the movie for this exclusive discussion we're going to feature with many of the people involved with this important film. That discussion will be moderated by Michelle Miao, the producer and host of The Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Now let's dim the overhead lights, get comfortable in our chairs, and watch Surviving the Silence. Cat came over. I thought she seems nice. I'll find out who this person is. I don't know if I even heard about being connected to the military. I'm not really sure when you told me, but it wasn't something that I could understand how the impact would happen. We both were resigned to the fact that we couldn't be out and that we had to really protect ourselves. I was able to build a secret passageway that went from our bedroom and the bedroom that was supposed to be my bedroom. We felt that we had to be closeted in our own home. I had a lot of anger about that. And it wasn't only our society, but it was the fact that Pat was in the military. I was asked to be the first Army National Guard chief nurse. That really rocked my world because I had no idea how I would continue on in this relationship with that long distance. But I knew I had to go. It was the top rung of my career ladder. When I got to the Pentagon, we frequently could not talk. We had to develop a code so that we could communicate when we thought lines were tapped. You were absolutely right when you were talking about the military. I just hate this oppression. It's hard for both of us. I love you for all of the tolerance that you exhibit. If I get this huge cardboard box, and I started looking in it, and I said, oh no, I can't do this to her. I applied for a top secret clearance. I made the statement, I am a lesbian. They said, the Army is going to start discharge proceedings against you. And I was stunned, embarrassed, hurt. I had always believed that the Army took care of its own. And now they were coming after me. I was sad that I had to be a part of that. I'm sorry that I had to do that to you. I wasn't ready to come out. Until now. Please welcome Pat Thompson. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the first nationwide premiere of Surviving the Silence in recognition of the 10th anniversary since the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. If you're joining us live, we want you engaged in this conversation. So please send your questions and comments in the chat box. I'm Michelle Miao. I'll serve as your moderator today. I'm part of the Commonwealth Club of California and produce programs there. It's called the Michelle Miao Show. It's your A through Z covering the LGBT, LMNOP, and everyone in between. I'm so grateful, so thankful that this has happened and we are doing this. It is just such a treat. We have a 
history making panel. So if you're joining us, please believe it. This is so incredibly special. So let's get started. Let me quickly introduce you to our panel. We have Cindy L. Abel, who is a filmmaker, writer, and speaker. Cindy formed Atlantis Moon Productions to develop projects that launch conversations and impact culture. And of course, is, a, is one of the producers of Surviving the Silence. We have Eric Fanning, who served as the 22nd Secretary of the Army and the first person to hold senior presidential appointments in all three military departments. We have Mary Newcomb, who we saw as Colonel uh, Kammermeyer's attorney, but also worked on several other LGBTQ military cases. And of course, the subjects of the film, the, the history makers, the stars, the, the courageous folks. Uh, we have Kearney, Colonel P Patsy Thompson and her wife, Barbara Brass, and Colonel Marguerite uh, Greta Kammermeyer. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, this is so much history in, in this Zoom panel that I'm incredibly nervous. So thank you all for making this happen. I, I didn't think that we were all going to fit in this Zoom. I didn't think that we're all gonna make it. So let's let's start with the question for all of you. We'll go one by one, but this nationwide premiere of the film, we're recognizing the 10th anniversary of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So there's a lot of reflection. There's a lot of going back. And although we're talking about 10 years after the repeal, some of us have gone through you know, the pain, the trauma, the silence, and uh, all the years leading up to the actual repeal. And so, you know, what was a big personal takeaway from you as you're reflecting back uh, during this time and looking, you know, at the, the 10th anniversary of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell? We'll start with the Colonel Thompson and her wife, Barbara. Well, um, I know that what we remember so clearly when that happened was we were driving along uh, in the car and somebody called on our cell phone, our wonderful close friends, um, Barbara and Dick, and they said, have you heard the news? And we uh. had heard the news. And I'll tell you that driving along, I was driving fortunately because when I looked over to Pat and she, she is always very stoic and uh, you could see a tear just kind of coming down her cheek when she heard that news because it was so significant to her and so important to the nation and to the military. And, and really to everybody in, in this country. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a huge impact. Carl, Carl Thompson, do you have more to add to that? Just kind of your big reflection. I know it's the 10th anniversary of the repeal, but there's so much history even before. It was a, a big relief for me. And I know for many other uh, military personnel um, that were affected by that for so many years. And so uh, it was It was just great. I'm so happy. Well, to tell you the truth, I was just thinking how angry I was that Don't Ask, Don't Tell existed for so long. Um, and it, it certainly, um, I was much more involved in the uh, transition to Don't Ask, Don't Tell than I was at the end of it. Um, but it was so disappointing that it existed that long, but I was awfully glad it was over. Eric. I, um, I guess a couple of things. I, I was in the Pentagon when Donuts Don't Tell was created as a very young junior aide. Um, and it's part of why I left the Pentagon and left national security. When I found myself back in the Pentagon in the Obama administration and it was repealed and certified, which was a very long, slow process, it was a tremendous relief um, because Donuts Don't Tell didn't impact me since I was a, a civilian directly but I didn't feel I could stay in an agency and an organization that continued to discriminate. So I, you know, in some ways it was existential. If, if we didn't get this done, I was going to have to leave the Pentagon again. But, but I would also just say a takeaway for me reflecting upon the, the 10th anniversary is a lot of people don't know that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was gay and lesbian. It's not transgender. And so we're not done yet. We have we have a lot of work left to do, and it's remarkable how much prog progress we, we've made on the gay and lesbian issue. But um, you know, we can't get Joe Biden in soon enough um, to restore <laughs> transgender service. Oh, oh, don't you worry. There's a question coming about you know the future and the work that we have to do in in a new administration. Um, uh, Colonel Kammermeyer. Well. You know, I've, I was working for 17 years uh, lobbying for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. 
And uh, on the signing day, I had been invited to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. And even now, I get choked up at the fact of being able to do that and have over 300 people in the room crying because it was such an impactful time. And Cindy? The first thing that comes to mind when I think about the repeal is standing on Eric Fanning's uh, steps at just outside of his his brownstone. And I was there in D.C. filming for something or other, and he was waiting to go to whichever of his offices in the Pentagon. And we were talking about it. And I said, do you really think it's going to happen? Do you? And he was confident. Yes, President Obama will sign this. And that's what comes to mind as a, on a very personal level. Um, on a broader level, I had friends who were in the same room with, with Colonel Kammermeyer and who were having that experience. And I know it meant a lot to me as someone who's been involved in LGBT advocacy for quite a while, but I had never served in the military. I had never been a huge military person. And yet I knew that this was just a huge moment in our culture that was also shifting. It was giving people permission to stop worrying about whether or not gay people were and lesbians were in the military. Staying with you, Cindy, what was it about Colonel Thompson and Cameron Meyer's story that made you want to be a part of the storytelling? You know, Michelle, the very first thing that drew me to it was their love story. At this point, they'd been together for 30 years. And I thought, wow, how do you stay together for 30 years, first of all? And then on top of that, how do you do that when you're having to stay in so many closets and dodge so many bullets, literal and not so literal, coming your way? And so I was fascinated by that. And I'm a diehard romantic anyway. And so I was drawn to that. And then as I learned the history behind all of it, and I thought, wow, wait a minute. I, Colonel Kammermeyer had long been a hero of mine, and I had met her a couple times. And how do I not know this story? And so the more I learned about it, the more I learned the history, I thought, wow, we've got something that needs to be told because there's so many people who were instrumental in helping change military policy and helping change culture so it would allow the policy to become repealed. And yet, We'll, we will never know their names. We owe them a huge, credit of debt, a huge debt of gratitude. And so I wanted to make sure that we told at least one of the stories behind the story of our community achieving one more little piece of equality and justice. Absolutely. Eric, you know, once Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, a lot of folks were talking about how we'd have to implement training, education, and practices that made it, you know, much more safe for service members to be out in the military. We'd love to hear your your thoughts or anything that you have to add on what changed immediately, what changed over time, and, uh, you know, what, what you feel the military culture is like now. Well, I, the, the process for repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell was a very lengthy process and agonizingly s- slow in the eyes of many. But I think it was designed to, to purposely that way in order for the culture of the military to to be ready when it was repealed. It, it, it really kind of felt like um, it had happened a long time ago when, when the certification finally took effect. Training is an important part of the military. Uh, this was a big aspect of, of ending Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I was worried about, I had to go through early training because I was a senior appointee with military working for me. And I was instantly relieved in training because every single question that came in from senior uniformed leaders, you know, um, can a gay do this? Can a lesbian do that? And the trainer just took that word out of the sentence and said, can a soldier do that? Can an airman do that? Can a Marine do that? And you just saw all these light bulbs go off across these leaders and realize, all right, that qualification doesn't matter anymore. It's about the person in uniform. And the, the, see, the military leadership is kind of interesting. What I saw happen when, when the repeal took place is it was no longer about gays and lesbians. It was about you know, if you were the commandant of the Marine Corps, it was about my Marines. I'm going to take care of my Marines. So it's almost, it almost felt binary. So it was really, um, it was comforting to see how fast that changed. But you asked about culture. Um, you know, the, the military 
comes out of the 18 year olds that we recruit and assess come out of society and the generals are debating one thing, but the 18 year olds are decades younger than they are and come out of a different society, a different culture and have different expectations. And so if you just talk to the senior uniform leadership, you're going to get one answer. If you go and talk to the 18 year olds, they literally will tell you you're an idiot for thinking <laughs> these things are an issue because they're just used to different things and they have different expectations um, and it happened with everything, everything that we did, women in combat, um, Sikhs and Muslims, re- religious accommodation, and even transgender service. Mary, uh, I have a question for you and kind of reflecting back at you know, the legal cases and, and seeing the film and seeing your thought process, looking at it from that point of view. As a civilian, I think most of us couldn't obviously find a, a reasonable argument to ban gay and lesbians from serving openly in the first place, but, you know, having to defend those who are discharged is, is a whole nother thing. And you're looking for um, not necessarily an argument, but like, for example, in the film, you know, it was about process. It was about documenting, you know, people's contributions. And uh, as Eric was saying, you know, talking about uh, service members as such, as that, not necessarily as gay and lesbians. Um, what can you say about, you know, the, uh, the military court systems or, or policies and how we can be effective, especially going forward. You know, Eric spoke a little bit about it in the beginning, but you know, we're talking about gays and lesbians. We still have work to do when it comes to transgender service members. Um, but yeah, your your thoughts and kind of going forward, the strategies of what worked, and you know, in the mind frame of of uh, you know, fighting this from a legal perspective. Well, you have to remember that um, unless someone was being charged with actual sexual conduct, they were outside the military courts. They were in administrative proceedings. Um, And the problem that I saw at the time, and I started working on this issue in the 80s when um, there wasn't as much attention, uh, but the problem was to protect your client at the same time you were helping them achieve their goal. If, if for instance, they were being sent to Iraq and it, was, it wasn't just um, a concern that they would be in danger from the enemy, the concern was that they would be in danger from their unit. And unit cohesion was given as the main reason for um, the continuing existence of regulation barring gays from serving. And, um, our attack, our approach was simply to break that down. What did that mean? And to try to obtain evidence that would show that the um, the attitudes of military leadership, and you'll see, uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of the sexual harass, uh, abuse and harassment in the um, Fort Hood. Um, Military leadership plays a great big role in setting the tone and making sure that people follow those um, better instincts. And so it was very important for us to show that the existing regulation was based on prejudice and that going forward, we needed to recognize that let someone serve, don't make it an issue, and that the unit will be better off in the end. And we did that in various ways. Colonel Kammermeyer, you know, in the, the film, I mean, I know I'm just one of many uh, folks who are inspired by just your courage. And 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 it, it felt like you, there was never a moment in which you felt like you had to, to back down. Uh, did you ever re- regret your decision to not lie? Did it did it ever? We didn't see that in the film, you know, if there was ever a moment in which you thought that you, you or felt like you were scared or, or, or regret your decision to say and be who you are? I, I never regretted telling the truth. Uh, and what I didn't know uh, and didn't understand was the impact that challenging a military regulation uh, would entail. And I had this attorney who sort of tried to warn me that uh, this was going to be a big ordeal, and uh, was I up for it? And I ended up having an opportunity to meet her other client, uh, Dusty Pruitt, who also challenged the military, and who also ultimately ended up succeeding. But I asked Dusty, I said, would you do it again? 
And she said, in a heartbeat. And so, you know, it's sort of like coming out. Uh, Once a person comes out, I have never heard anyone say, I wish I hadn't done that. Mm -hmm. There may have been repercussions, but you never regret doing the right thing and valuing yourself as a human being. Thank you so much for that. Uh, We have a ton of comments from our audience and some questions. So I'm going to turn to that. Thank you, audience. And again, keep them coming. We want you involved and engaged in the conversation. Lots of uh, Colonel Thompson and and Barbara fans here as well. Um, We have a comment. Thank you for this wonderful film. I served 22 years pre Don't Ask, Don't Tell and during Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I'm currently also writing a memoir about it. So, so grateful for less silence. Another comment from our audience here. Thank you for telling your stories, Colonel Pat and Barb. You make us so proud. Hashtag P flag proud. Um, Another comment. Such an important story to have documented. Congratulations on a wonderful film. And uh, and, and a couple more um, and some questions. But I want to ask mine first because there are so many uh, Colonel Thompson and Barbara fans. I mean, all those years of silence and, and uh, patience and um, what I would feel, you know, as, as torment. Um, if you have any advice or any words for those who are, still can't necessarily be out, who are still fighting, you know, for um, uh, equal rights and, and also for those of us in, in long-term relationships and in, re- in relationships that matter to us and can't necessarily be out about it. I can just say that it feels really good to be out after all those years of uh, hiding my sexual orientation. Um, that uh, when I came out to my family, I thought I would be nervous, but I wasn't. And they were very receptive. And um, so I felt so much better after that. But I was 80 years old at the time. Well, I also think that it's, uh, as Greta said, you know, we need to be who we are and share that as best we can. But there are situations where everybody has to figure out in their own personal life and their own personal story how safe it is um, and how safe they feel. Uh, not that they would be uh, getting accolades for coming out, but they that their lives would not be in danger for coming out. So those are in significant aspects of even today when we've come as far as we have. I know we've come a long way on one level, but we also have um, stepped backwards in the last four years so desperately. So we have a lot of catching up work to do. And that to me is an important factor in everybody's decision to come out. They need to know where their world, their personal world uh, stands on how safe they, they can be and how much risk they're willing to take. There's a question from our audience and um, any of you can answer this, but PFLAG was mentioned in the film. Could you say a word about how PFLAG has made a difference in your lives? Oh, I could talk about PFLAG for days. (laughs) (laughs) We'll start with you then, Barb. Uh, well, I knew about PFLAG years ago, and I would go to the Pride uh, events in Sacramento and, and see the table and think, I love these people. I just think they're wonderful. They're fighting for my rights. I can't believe it. And there's a whole organization, a national and uh, extended into the world organization that is fighting for my rights. And I never thought I sh- could or would be a part of the organization. I thought it was for families, friends, um, parents of the LGBT community. And when we first went to a meeting and listened to a friend of ours talk about how he came out after being married and having children and shared his story, and we were at the local PFLAG chapter meeting, I realized we all, everybody in the world has to attend a PFLAG chapter at least once to understand that everybody has something to learn, everyone has something to offer, and everyone has something to, to share. Uh, there's the, the dramatic changes we witnessed in the first year or two were, were a few mothers and grandmothers of uh, LGBT grandkids or children going through their uh, learning and growing and changing process. And they 
went from crying at every meeting to laughing and embracing their children and embracing all of us as the community and, and learning so much and offering so much. So yeah, PFLAG is a phenomenal organization. And if you all out there have a chance to go to at least one meeting, you'll know what that's about. It, it's, it's well worth it. And I got my best education about uh, transgender people from some of our members there who uh, spoke openly to us and answered our questions. It was great. Anyone else want to add? P flag? Well, I could just add something perhaps with a little bit of a different um, twist to it is, you know, in the old days, uh, it was the parents who were at fault for making us gay. And so they carried a great burden of what they had, you know, put on their kids. And so initially, PFLAG was also a support system for other parents so that they could begin to learn and to understand that this was not a fault issue. It was a matter of who people were and that it had to do with those individuals, not with the parenting process. And I, I think the first time I was at a PFLAG meeting, it was recognizing that we, we were all going through this, this uh, life's journey of coming to terms with that there was nothing wrong with being gay. It was just our internalized homophobia that had gotten in the way and we now had to work our way through. And uh, so, you know, it is a wonderful organization that has also come a long way on their own. And uh, on that note, uh, Colonel Kammermeyer, there's a comment for you. A, a huge thanks to Colonel Kammermeyer, who gave me the courage to continue to serve. My wife was silent throughout my 13 months in Iraq. And then a follow-up question for Colonel Pat or Colonel Thompson, I'm sorry, how important was it for you to have the conversation with Colonel Kammermeyer where she said, you did me right? It was amazing. It, I, it, it's difficult to explain how warm that made me feel. It just hit me in the heart, you know, and it was just some of the best news I could ever have gotten um, that she said that. Um, no, it if, if I could just interject, you know, um, when, when Mary was my attorney and we had the administrative board hearing and um, Pat uh, had told me at that meeting that she was really not, really didn't want to do, uh, do what she was supposed to do in terms of sitting as president of the board. I told her that I really wanted her to be there. I had absolutely no idea that she had a history and that she was a lesbian. Uh, and, and I'm really grateful for that because I, I don't know that I would have felt comfortable in putting her in such a, an awkward position. Uh, but I mean, it was because of, of Pat's openness uh, that my attorney was able to do her job. So we were ultimately able to succeed. And so there is, there is this link that we have in one another's lives that are one is very contingent uh, upon the other. And uh, I know I am forever grateful. A question for Cindy from the audience. Uh, were you ever conflicted judging the actions that were taken decades ago through today's lens, judging history by today's standards sort of thing? I don't feel that surviving the silence really judges anything that happened. I'd like to think that I presented an opportunity for Greta to share her experience, for Mary to share her experience, you know, when it came to the trial, and for Pat to share hers, and for them, them to revisit it some 20 plus years later. Um, I do know that, you know, the lens through which I look is the lens through which I look. And I will admit that early on when I first heard the very first time when Barb was telling me their story after a screening of my first film, Breaking Through, I did feel judgment. And I thought, oh, my God, how on earth could anyone have done that to one of their own? And fortunately, I was eating something, so I didn't spit those words out. 
But then as I learned more, I started to realize that what Pat did was actually the best thing. And Eric Fanning talks about that in our film. And I wanted to present that because I do think that today we look at what's happening through today's lens, right? Especially people who didn't live through that period of time. And so I wanted to present the facts, if you will, and to have them interpreted or explained by someone who has seen the benefit of what Colonel Kammermeyer did, what Mary did, and what Colonel Thompson did. You know, some in front, some behind the scenes, and then now someone who has experienced firsthand the benefit of what they did. So, yeah, so I don't feel like I was judging um, any of it, honestly. I have a, a really important question for all of you, and we'll start with Eric, and that's, gosh, you know, when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, it just seemed like, it seemed like the summer of love or something that we were just going to continue on, you know, uh, this, this progress and, and, and keep going and keep going and keep going. But, um, obviously the last four years has been a different story for LGBTQ rights and our movement. And so curious to know how this administration, the, this outgoing administration or the last four years has impacted you, um, Eric. Well, I, boy, that could take the rest of the session. Um, <laughs> but on this specific issue, if we go back, you know, I remember when um, when the president tweeted about ending transgender service, and I was still kind of recovering from my eight year run in government, and you know, I closed the computer. I was trying not to work very hard in 2017, closed the computer, took a shower, shaved, put on a suit because I knew it was going to be a busy day because we had to fight this. Um, it's hard uh, to go back permanently on some of these things. Uh, he had the power to, to end the policies that we put in place in the Obama administration. But it's an interesting, if you go all the way back to segregating the military by Truman, we think these are debates about whether or not we can allow people to serve when in fact, they're really debates about having policy catch up with reality. Blacks were already serving in the military. Women had been dying in combat before we opened up all positions to, to, to women. Sikhs have been allowed to wear turbans uh, on and off again for many, many years in this military, certainly the British military. There was a Sikh who was the, the Minister of Defense of Canada. Uh, it's the same with gays and lesbians, it's the same with transgender. They're already serving. Uh, and that's you know part of the educational process for the, the uniform leadership. And when you when you bring them when you bring them along and you introduce them to people in the uniform of their service that they're leading, and they realize I'm not deciding, having a conversation about whether they can come in, they're already in, and I'm I'm responsible for them. They're, these are my people. And so I think it was very disruptive, certainly for the transgender Americans who are serving to go through what this president did to them. But it's disruptive for the, the, the units and for the leadership as well, because they had processed, I've got really good soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines that are transgender and are serving, and they've made this commitment to their country. So who are we to say that they shouldn't? Um, so I, 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 you know, we had shown um, that transgender service um, wasn't an issue. It wasn't um, uh, something that just in and of itself should preclude you from being able to serve. And it had moved forward and it had developed the training and had done all the research on, on the, uh, the medical issues and, and training issues and deployment issues and so forth. And so I think it'll be easy to unwind, but it's been very disruptive um, for those Americans who are serving, transgender Americans. And uh, it, it was really hard um, uh, to watch, I'm sure, for all of us. Mary. On the same question? The same question. Yeah, we'd love to hear from all of you on this question. Just kind of, you know, if we're reflecting back at the 10th year anniversary, it's something to celebrate this, this big milestone of this policy being repealed. But at the same time, this outgoing administration in the last four years has impacted all of us in various ways. And so we'd love to hear how it has impacted you, Mary. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the four years is almost over. <laughs> I know, I know. We can sigh of relief and we'll talk about, you know, what we're hopeful for from the, the next four years. But how was the last four years? What was it like for you? 
Well, I'm no longer doing gay rights litigation, especially I'm not doing military stuff anymore. But um, in terms of uh, the last four years of uh, complete frustration and anger and um, despair for our country, uh, it was a very tough time. I think that's the, what you'll find from everyone <laughs> on this panel, at least. Right, right. Well, we saw you know clips in the the film, uh, Barb and Colonel Thompson. You out there, you know, protesting. I'd love to hear you know for you. I mean, it, it the the activism certainly continued. Yes, absolutely. That uh, that election sparked me into action like I never expected I'd have in my whole existence, and the energy I put in for the last four years has exhausted me and I'm feeling it now. Uh, in a way, the COVID lockdown has been my time to rest and regroup and refocus, but the energy that sustained me during that time, I, I don't re really know where it came from. I know a lot of my energy comes from my, my deep seated anger about the world. And that has not changed. That has not changed even now with a breath of fresh air that we have a new administration coming in and an old regime going out because we have so much cleanup work to do. But uh, yes, the, the last four years were powerful for me, absolutely powerful. Well, the thing that bothered me <clears throat> right off the bat with the new with the Trump administration was what they did to the EPA. That's our fresh air and drinking water, you know. <clears throat> and so that was one of the first things I, I noticed. And it went downhill from there. Then, you know, they were taking children away from their parents and, you know, just so many awful things. <sighs> there was no bottom. <laughs> yeah. Still not. Still not. <laughs> it's the swamp. Mm -hmm. Colonel Kammermeyer? I think uh, it was a very scary time because uh, you didn't know what was going to happen next. There was the uncertainty of, well, uh, is our uh, marriage at, at risk? Is our um, job security at risk? Is it going to, what is going to next be taken away? And trying to say, well, you know, these are laws created by by Congress, and yet you have an ineffective Congress uh, who is kowtowing to a, 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 a an autocrat, and uh, so there really was the frightening part of of what happens next, and how is it that we can continue to uh, stand up and support our rights? And it it really talks about the fragility and the fact that there are now seventy two million people who probably could be convinced that we're not entitled to rights. And that itself is um, really a scary time. I'm optimistic, but uh, cautious. Yeah, we'll get to the optimism. I guess for me too, it's also a, a different definition of patriotism that took over the country that, uh, you know, invigorated some form of hate that are, that wasn't recognizable to me, at least in, in my lifetime. And here we are listening to service members, those who have devoted their life, you know, to the, to protecting Americans talk about how scary the last four years was. Uh, Cindy, your thoughts, what the last four years. Definitely echo everything that's been said. Uh, one of the most egregious things to me is that many things that this is, president has done does not come from a deeply held belief. I mean, that would be cold comfort if it were. And yet it comes from a place of transaction. How does it benefit him in the short term, in the immediate moment? And that's almost more of a slap in the face in my perspective. Um, and it certainly has given voice and shown a light on people who actually do believe that we do not deserve the same rights and responsibilities as other Americans in this country, either because of gender identity, sexual orientation, uh, gender itself, um, race, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we now see are people who used to live in the shadows. So on one hand, that's very painful on the other hand, it allows us to confront the reality of what has been happening 
for the last 20 years, if you will, in our country. And so the positive there, in my mind, is that now we can actually deal with what's really there. And it's painful and it's very difficult and it's demoralizing because we thought we were closer to a more inclusive culture than we actually are. And yet now we can get to the business of handling what is real, how do we address those things? And I think with the incoming administration, we'll have an opportunity to do that. But the, I don't think that the body blows are over yet, regardless of who's in, in legislative power or in government. I think people are going to continue to express themselves in ways that are at the very least painful and in some situations deadly to many of us in our communities. And that legacy will live on. However, I think it's always good to shine light in the darkness so we know what we're really dealing with. And by doing that, there are people who like Colonel Pat and like Barb, who never were activists at this level before, who said, that's it. I cannot let my country go any further in, toward decline and other people who are engaged and have stayed engaged because of what we've seen. And as much as I would have loved to have a president Hillary Clinton for so many reasons, I doubt that people would have been as engaged as they are now and will hopefully continue to be when we have president Biden and vice president Harris. Mm. We will get to our, our thoughts on, on the incoming uh, new administration soon. We, we're going to turn our attention to our audience. Thank you so much for the comments and the questions. We're getting so many. Um, here's a question. After January 20th, the Biden-Harris admin or administration has so many important things to do to get our country and our democracy back on track. What would you like to see as the items to be on top of their LGBT agenda? The Equality Act. Pass the Equality Act. I agree. It's one of the many. And then um, open transgender service, open military service to transgender folks fully and completely as it was when Eric Fanning was working for the Department of Defense. Eric, anything to add to that? Well, I, th they're actually... Um, well over a hundred, if not hundreds of, of executive actions and departmental actions that this administration has taken in the last four years, um, some small, some large, uh, that impact our community across virtually every single agency. And so I'd like to see them overturn those, return those as quickly as possible. But that's an issue that we that we face with our government right now is Congress has, is so divided and, and some would say dysfunctional that instead of passing laws that really codify um, progress, it's executive actions. And the, and the great thing about them is that the, the President Biden will be able to do that, but they're not as solid as something that's passed in law. So I would like to see them that they've got this list. Transgender service is certainly one of them all of the things that they have in their power to do by executive order to return us to where we were just four years ago, but work to try and get things passed uh, in law, which is going to be difficult. It's a, it's, um, you know, we got the White House back, uh, but the Democrats, the margins in the House have gone down. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the Senate. Uh, and, and there's not a lot of bipartisan spirit and, and spirit of compromise going on right now. But there are hundreds of things um, that, uh, that a new president, President Biden, and new cabinet members and agency heads can do um, to not only overturn what's happened in the last four years, but move us forward beyond that. Anyone else? I always uh, kind of liken the last four years to what happens when the sewer explodes. You know, the cleanup is phenomenal. That's what we're dealing with now. So you can't clean it all in one day or one with one wipe. It takes a lot. It'll take a long time. Eric said it uh, so well, and he knows the, the back stories of some of these things, the, the in and outs of, of all the, the military um, and governmental changes, but just from a perspective of a civilian looking at our country, 
right now that we have a huge cleanup effort to work on. And I'm hoping that, as Cindy said, that people are engaged enough and and our story, maybe who people who need to see it, who are on the side of those who would uh, do us harm, might change their heart and their mind. And that's really what I'm hoping. Uh, it's hard to do that. I think it's difficult. It depends on, I, I believe, where this film goes uh, around the world as well as around in uh, media um, events here. Whatever happens, we need to show people that we're all human beings trying to live a happy, healthy life. And we're just one little story of that. So if somebody who needs to understand that we are not the enemy and we're not to be uh, eradicated, then, then we've made a huge um, impact. You know, if I could just add, uh, Michelle, to that, I think it's important when we look at LGBTQ plus issues that we recognize the intersectionalities, that it's not just this particular group, and that we consider that right now in what feels like concentration camps, you know, along the borders and even here in Georgia, there are people who are suffering because they're LGBTQ, especially transgender people and especially transgender people of color, whether it's in these concentration camps or it's in prisons. And we need to pay attention to that. And it's so easy as, you know, white cisgender female to look at it and go, oh, we need to pass the equality legislation. Well, we also have a lot of other things. And I do believe we need the Equality Act and we need a lot of other things as well. And we need to recognize that, you know, there should not be concentration camps in the United States. We need to do something about prison reform in the United States. All of those issues impact all of us in various ways. And hopefully with the Biden administration being more diverse than others that we've had in the past in our country, some of those issues will get addressed from a more holistic perspective. Absolutely. Mary? Anything to add? And it was it was a question that I was going to ask all of you anyway, which is, uh, you know, kind of what your thoughts are, what you're hopeful for as far as uh, President-elect Biden and, um, and, you know, his administration. What are some issues, LGBTQ issues, that you would like to see the administration prioritize? Um, you know, I'm coming at it from a relatively privileged position. I'm married. I have two kids who I've raised. I've got, um, I'm retired now. I have many privileges in this life. What I would love to see, and I think this, this is what Cindy was talking about, is for us to see everybody as part of the solution and trying to identify those issues that take us forward. Prison reform is a huge one for me, criminal, you know, uh, the criminal justice system. Um, those are issues that are relative to the work I've been doing in the last 10 years. So, you know, all of those issues, I don't pick and choose. I, I see them all as a, as a cloth and that mm -hmm. we can move forward on all of those. And obviously climate change is, it has to be moved to the top of the chart no matter what. Absolutely. There, there is a lot of work to do. I hope you all are not going anywhere. But uh, uh, Colonel Kammermeyer, anything to add? Kind of your, your feelings and what you'd like prioritized? Human behavior, decency, uh, the ability to trust uh, what uh, the organizations and agencies are saying because the people who are there uh, have credibility. Uh, you know, I think one of the greatest losses, along with the, the specifics, is also who, who can you trust in terms of uh, getting the messages out and uh, feeling that when a president says something, it's not his just knee-jerk uh, position, but rather one based on knowledge and understanding and consultation 
and uh, so I'm 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 looking forward to getting rid of the swamp that we have dealt with for these past uh, four years. And to head back to our audience here who are very lively and engaged. Thank you so much for sending in your comments and your questions. Um, here is a question for Cindy, I think. What are future distribution plans? Worldwide distribution is my vision and intention for this film. And, you know, we have been selected by, as of today, 27 film festivals throughout the world. L literally right now, this festival is playing at the Hamptons Dock Fest in Hamptons, New York, and at the Veterans Film Festival in Australia. And so we want to continue that. And so, you know, we're in conversations with distributors open to others as well, looking at what is the best possible solution for making sure that the film is available in as many ways possible to as many people possible, as well as able to be used in educational settings, whether it was in two or three weeks, um, Barb and Pat are going to be, you know, speaking in an educational environment via Zoom. They have been talking to people for the last five and a half, six years um, about their story and really just changing hearts and minds and giving people something different, a different way to think about what it means to be LGBTQ. And so I want this film to be a conduit for that you know, or a catalyst rather to spark those conversations that need to be had. And so whatever the best way is, that's what I'm considering right now. How do we reach as many people as possible in order to share this love story and also to help correct a little bit of history that hasn't, hadn't yet been written? We need to add a little chapter or at least a paragraph when it comes to the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. That includes Colonel Patsy Thompson. On that note, I have a question for Barb and Colonel Thompson. Uh, do you still live in the same house and is the secret door <laughs> to each other's room, is it still there? Yes, that door yes. is there. We live in this house and uh, we both say as long as we can crawl up those and down those stairs, we're, we're going to stay here uh, as long as possible. We, we love our home. Uh, it, it, it's a shelter uh, in a way sheltered us in so many ways and been, as uh, you saw in the film, my palette. So I still have work to do, but nothing major. And my focus is to uh, keep us healthy and happy in here. So I've added grab bars everywhere uh, that, that I can and things like that. And we do have actually four floors of living space. So uh, we have to keep mobile. And yeah. if I can just, we have to exercise a lot. <laughs> And in, in some ways, you know, their statement, which was, you know, to, to cover their statement about building a bed and breakfast has absolutely come true because whenever my crew and I would be in town and also when uh, Colonel Kamelmeyer joined us, we stayed at Pat and Barb's, you know, 312 Berkeley support group. And it's the most amazing place you want to stay. You know, you've got to see a little glimpse of the garden out back, but let me tell you, I wish I had that garden right now. I just want to go lay in a hammock and enjoy the birds and all the beautiful flowers that Barb cares for. Um, so they've made their vision of a bed and breakfast come true, at least for some of us. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to a couple of our crew members who were also on this call, Michael Bruno and Jesse Freeman, who were with me from day one and stayed at their beautiful bed and breakfast and who are responsible for really shaping the story from the beginning and making sure that we had the footage that we needed in order to be able to tell this story. And it's a very skeleton crew. And the only way we made it through was because of them and several other people who came on board to fill in where we needed them to, you know, whether it was our composer, Denise Gentilini, who composed the original song at the end, as well as the whole score, you know, or our other editors who played a part in the color. And it's just been such an amazing journey of doing this. And no one who I asked to participate said no. You know, I, on the advice of my story consultant, Susan Satterfield, I went and spoke with my friend, Eric, and said, you know, I'm missing this piece. And I think you're the one who can fill in that part of the story. And he said, yeah, sure. When do you want to do it? 
And everyone along the way has participated because they saw the story that needed to be told, the love story between two people who've been together for so long and who had an impact behind the scenes and how that complemented the story that some of us knew of Colonel Greta Kammermeyer. And then we're able to bring that into a more modern time, a more contemporary time. Absolutely. It's hard to believe, you know, it's 10 years since the the repeal, but then also um, to know that there's so many years leading up to the actual repeal. So, so many of us have been in this, this movement for so long. Uh, Colonel Kammermeyer, you know, speaking of having to tell our stories and making an impact on, on people's lives in today's generation, tomorrow's generation. Um, what has been the response? Have you heard from, you know, folks who have seen the film or, or read about you, you know, maybe not necessarily someone who's in the community or someone who is part of the fight to repeal, don't ask, don't tell, but I'm sure of it that you've received comments from folks that, that was touched by your story. Well, nowadays I'm such history that it's high school and junior high school kids that say, you know, we're doing a historical perspective and <laughs> if we could interview you. And, uh, you know, the fact that people are, are interested and uh, mm -hmm. is, is good because it is important to know your history and try to understand the struggle to get to a better place. And uh, so it's... Um, you know, with now with uh, the ten year anniversary, it is sort of touching base with people who were there in the beginning, and were were part of that early effort. And you know, what we don't always give credit to are the people who went before us, before our notoriety. You know, uh, there was Perry Watkins and Miriam Ben Shalom and Joe Stefan and, and hundreds of others who n never were able to be either in the right place or have the right support. Uh, and so we are the history and storytellers of their stories also. And uh, this is an opportunity for that that thread to continue and is is so important uh, so that we don't fall back uh, into a worse time. We we heard you know some uh, stories and even yourself, uh, Colonel Kammermeyer, of, of folks being able to be reinstated. Um, we also learned that when you were discharged, you lost the federal recognition, and then Eric ex had explained it so well. And articulately, uh, that you know, when you lose the recognition, that that impacts your your benefits. Um, for those of us who don't know, who are who are still learning about this, you know, what is the, I guess, the status now um, for those who were reinstated, those who lost benefits, has has that all been ironed out and people, you know, are treated equally? For those who were discharged, and and Eric can probably speak to it better from his his standpoint. But people who were discharged, uh, they can appeal uh, to have their discharges um, upgraded. And the, what is it, the Modern Military Association of America is sort of the, the umbrella organization that can help guide through that. But it is still a one-on-one -on -one, uh, struggle. And it's not like a blanket, everybody who was discharged uh, can uh, have, have it upgraded. And also that was the time when uh, it was considered a mental illness and therefore it was a pre-existing condition or instead of being uh, post-traumatic stress that, you know, there were all of these other circumstances that really need to be re-evaluated in terms of uh, reinstatement of individuals um, who had less than honorable discharges. And Eric, I defer to your expertise. There, there's a there's a there's a lot of support to um, change the status, the discharge, to upgrade the discharge status. But part of the problem is it, there's not a database you can go into and find everyone who is discharged because they were gay or lesbian. In in many cases, um, commanders, the system found some proxy reason to discharge gays and lesbians. Knew they were gay and lesbian, uh, went after them under some other pretext 
And so it's coded in the system in a whole series of different ways. There's no way to go in and, and you know, if Congress were to say, change the discharge status of everyone who is discharged because they were gay or lesbian, there, there's no way to do that. It really has to be done from the top down and the bottom up. As Greta said, you can appeal that. Uh, and, and, you know, the system is very welcome to that now. Uh, uh, it took a long time to get there, but we can't find those, all of those people on our own because um, it, it's not a nice and clean history. A lot of people were chased out under other reasons, other, other pretenses um, because they were gay and lesbian, uh, but it didn't, that's not what shows up in the record for why they were discharged. Thank you um, for for just clearing that up. And, it, you know, that was definitely a question after you see the movie. It's like, well, what happened to so many others? Uh, we have a comment from our audience. Thanks to all featured for the service you've given to our world through your lives. Thanks to Cindy Abel for continuing to, to take on vital issues, including in our Italian film, Bullied to Death. Uh, we also have a question, actually, for, for Cindy did did you have trouble getting B-roll or footage from the current administration? Fortunately, we didn't have to go to the current administration. Um, almost all of what we used from the current administration, it was news related and is considered in the public domain. Other things we had to go and get the clearances for, but it was no different than getting them for anything else. Fortunately. A question for Barb and Colonel Thompson um, coming out, Colonel Thompson coming out at, at you know, 80 years old. Um, do you get it, questions or comments from other LGBT seniors who've come out late in uh, uh, their age in terms of being an inspiration or, you know, or, or responses from others who come out later? Not really. I, I don't I don't know any others. Do you know any others, Barb? Um, well, a lot of our friends are um, in the age group of between my age and Pat's age. And uh, nobody has had a similar experience of coming out to their family at, at an older age that we know of. They're either not out at all still, and they're in their 60s to, to 90s, or they're uh, they've been out for a while and, and survived that on in a positive or semi-negative way. So not really. Um, I do have a question, though, that I haven't been able to ask. And uh, it's a question of Cindy. If she had any surprises during the course of this time, six plus years of filming and all the events and all the uh, everything that happened, were there were there any surprises that came up for you? a good question. I have to think on that one a bit, Barb. Um, nothing, I mean, everything was new and unfolding. I knew enough about, you know, their stories and Colonel Kamelmeyer's stories. And then I knew where to, what we needed Mary to talk about, what we needed Eric to talk about. Um, so on one hand, there weren't any surprises, but there was a whole lot of new information. And those you know, that's the beauty I think of a documentary because you start down a certain path and then along the way you realize wow we need to weave this in and what I thought was important at the very beginning may not be as critical it's still important but it's not as critical as new information and we had kind of a, a happy surprise or happy accident in that it took us about a year longer to complete the film than what we had foreseen. And so the end changed because if you remember at the end of the film, Barb says something to the effect of, you know, we're not just walking off holding hands into the sunset. Well, that was going to be the end pretty much. And then came 2016 and they ramped it up to a whole new level. And so when you have two folks who become activists at this point in their lives, you can't just go, oh yeah, that's nice and not film it. No. So then we extended a little bit more and made sure that we captured their further transformation. And our producer, Mark Smolowitz, commented to me once that you can really see 
on film the transition of the early interviews with Barb and Pat and the way that they uh, shared their stories to now and just the, the confidence and the power that they exude, which I'm sure it, on some level comes from having been out for much longer and out to the world and gaining um, the strength that comes from that, which then can inspire other people to go and do likewise as they're able. As we're winding down on our amazing talk in the film, it's been incredible. This has been so great. I couldn't have been at a better place, you know, for the 10th anniversary, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, and then as we head into 2021 with the new uh, president and a new administration and his team, hopefully, right, we're hearing all the good news of the individuals and folks that he's putting together for his team, Um I think the last question is is really about you know this this film surviving the silence what we learned from it what you learned from your entire experience and your your movement and kind of what you hope people take from it when they see it and how that applies to the hope for 2021 for you know continuing to do the work um i'll, I'll begin with cindy What do I hope that people take from it? I hope that we all take from it. And what reminds, what I'm reminded of when there are dark days and there are dark, have been dark days personally in the last year is that Pat Thompson showed us that even when things look like there is no way, we can do what Congressman John Lewis, who'd been my congressman, used to say, we have to make a way out of no way. And she did that. And every single act that we take, as small as it can seem in the moment, can really have an impact and ripple out into the world. I'm sure when she was having to you know, go to Washington and discharge her now friend, she wouldn't have imagined that now her story is a platform for shining light on what's possible in the world. And so I try to remind myself that we must do the right thing, no matter how hard it is, and always find a way where it seems that there is no way. That's so beautiful. Uh, Eric. I, I, I guess what I would say is, um, as we watch this story, uh, to remember that we don't know other people's stories. Uh, we don't know what's um, happening in their lives, what, what the full story is, what's happening behind the scenes. And the title is Surviving the Silence. And I think we need to remember there are still a lot of people serving in silence. The end of uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell didn't mean that everybody came out or everybody was outed. Um, and so there's just a lot of work that that still needs to be done in the military and the culture of the military um, to make sure that it is truly diverse and inclusive and, and reflective of the country that, that it is protecting. Mary. Well, I, you know, one of the things that's been so powerful for me is it's been 30 years since Greta and I started work, working together. And, um, you know, in, the con what <laughs> the the thirty years is a long time and a lot of change and um, Patsy and Barb understand this too and to see the impact of coming out and it's nowhere more crystallized than in the military because that's where it has such dramatic effect. Mm -hmm. um, to see how the changes have come about over those 30 years, how people have um, embraced that opportunity. And absolutely, there are still people who are struggling with that process. But I just want to say that I think the act of coming out has been the most powerful um, act of our movement. And it is the thing that led us to become the people we are and to do the work we've done. And I, I really look forward to and hope to see um, the young people understanding that power and being able to act on it. 
Colonel Kamenmeyer? What I started to say when Mary was talking was, no, it's not possible that it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel that old. I was just a baby. <laughs> Well, what's what's interesting in all of this, and, and as the stories are told from others also, is that six degrees of separation. And, you know, the six of us have now, you know, sort of melded into one family because there is such an interplay of what our experience, and we have learned uh, what other people were doing at the time things were taking place. Uh, and so it's the building block that is like, well, there were so many things uh, that were going on. And then what it melded into was this repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which we now celebrate uh, on the 22nd. You know, it'll be 10 years since that signing ceremony where for the first time it felt like a vindication of all of the work that had gone into it. Uh, not not to say that it wasn't horrible to begin with because we lost over 14,000 were discharged from the military during those years. Uh, but it still is to say that it, there was a movement. Uh, change did occur. Uh, women have gotten the right to vote. Uh, now we have the right to serve in combat where we're capable. And, and so... It's it's the little pieces that build upon one another until there is a full house. You're all making me want to cry. Um, so I'm sure of it that Barb and Colonel Thompson, who have the last words, will actually make us cry. <laughs> I want to say that how thankful I am that Cindy, Abel, Michael, and Jesse made this film and um, Michael actually designed the logo that you see and so we love that and we love him. Um, I think that this film for future LGBTQ people will serve as, um, as a historical document and I am thankful to be part of it. And I uh, also think that, uh, I may have said it earlier, that we have to use this vehicle to move forward in our culture and see that the people who should see it, who have different points of view, who need enlightenment, mm -hmm. who need to open their hearts and understand uh, that the human condition has uh, varies on such a spectrum. Uh, I've always felt that it, it is like a rainbow. Uh, in a way that people fit every single little niche along the way. Nobody is the same. We're, we're all snowflakes with different patterns, finger, fingerprints with different patterns. So I think that, that having this story as one of millions of stories, but at least th this story is lit uh, and can serve as uh, an educational, cultural vehicle to make some positive change. That's that's all I've ever wanted in my life. And to, to be a part of something like this has uh, given me an amazing feeling of gratitude, as Pat said, to Cindy and the, the team who put this together and, and to everybody else here on the panel who's willing to show up every time we do something like this and, and make the perspective be even more. I learn something each time when I listen to Eric or Greta or Mary, I learn and Cindy too. I learn something each time. So it's so important that we continue with this and we are willing to, uh, it's easy. All we have to do is put on something from the, the waist up and sit in front of something. <laughs> like, no, no, tell, no, no airplanes, no travel, no hotels. It's, it's perfect. So yeah, we, we will continue to keep, talking and keep sharing and hope that uh, we do get the worldwide distribution that Cindy is looking to uh, affect. And one, one last thing, I have this little piece of paper that I keep in, in front of my plate when I'm eating. It's always sitting there. And it was, uh, it was written by Cory Booker and it is hope over fear, love over hate. Mm. That warms my heart. I love it. We're going to end on that love over fear. 
Um, one really, really quick question. Uh, you know, we all should support Surviving the Silence. Go see it, uh, support it in any way you can. So, Cindy, how can people do that? Survivingthesilence.com. Awesome. We keep, yeah, we keep updated there, and people can also donate there if they want to help us on this next stage of our journey. Thank you for asking. Absolutely. Thank you for having us here tonight. This was uh, such an honor, Michelle. Thank it's, you. It, it truly is all this history here. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I was so nervous. I, I mean, it was the biggest thing that I'd ever done. So yeah. thank you all for being here. And thank you to the entire team, the production team who put this film together. Thank you for joining us this evening, especially those on the East Coast. I know it's getting later and later and you're probably hungry. So we'll let you go. Thank you to the Commonwealth Club of California for providing the platform for us to do this and all the partners and our sponsor, Weatherford BMW of Berkeley. We'll see you next time. For other programs, you can head to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. We'll see you next time. Thank you.